We're continuing our introduction to the science of biochemistry by considering Chapter 1, The Chemical Basis of Life, and in this lesson we'll be reviewing the types of biological molecules. Biological molecules are actually composed of only a small subset of elements from the periodic table, as illustrated in this figure. The most abundant biological elements include carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, our so-called first tier of elements, shaded in bright orange in our figure. The second tier elements, that is those that are less abundant, are in a paler shade of orange and include calcium, potassium, sodium, and magnesium. Trace elements make up the third and fourth tier, that is, uh, in terms of their relative abundance, and these include several transition metals, that is, in the palest shade of orange. This same relative abundance of elements is present in all known life forms, so indeed a small subset of the full periodic table. I would point out, however, that because an element is present in only trace amounts does not signify a lack of importance. These elements are all vital to maintaining and propagating life. The first class of biological molecules we'll consider includes the amino acids. Looking at the structural formula for the amino acids at the bottom of the slide, we can see that this type of molecule is aptly named. It contains both an amino group, NH3+, and a carboxylic acid group, COO-, both bound to a central carbon atom. Because of the presence of these two groups, each amino acid has both acid and base properties and carries at least these two ionizable groups. The identity of each amino acid is determined by the chemical structure of its side chain, or R group, highlighted here in red. Each has its own unique type of chemistry based on the nature of the chemical groups present in that side chain. We'll learn more about amino acids and the polymers they form in Chapter 4. Our next class of biological molecules includes carbohydrates, literally hydrates of carbon from the chemical formula highlighted here. They're also known as saccharides from the Latin meaning sweet sand. The simplest carbohydrate or sugar is a monosaccharide such as glucose illustrated to the right. As you can see from the structure of this molecule, carbohydrates carry multiple OH groups and are readily convertible between the linear or open form on the left and the cyclic or closed form on the right. The interconversion between linear and cyclic forms has to do with the presence of those hydroxyl groups and the reactive aldehyde group on the end. This makes for some rather interesting chemistry as we'll see when we get to chapter 11. In the figure on the far right, notice the thick line on the bottom of the figure and the thin line on the top. This is meant to illustrate to some extent the orientation of the molecule in three-dimensional space. The thicker line represents an orientation in front of the page and the thinner line behind the page. Next we have nucleotides, molecules containing three main components as illustrated in our figure. A five-carbon sugar highlighted in red is at the heart of this molecule. In this case, it is ribose, but it might also be deoxyribose. To this sugar are attached a nitrogenous cyclic base in blue and one or more phosphate groups highlighted here in green. All nucleotides include these three main components at least, but they can also be more complex in structure, as we'll see. Our final type of biological molecule includes lipids and is of all the four main types the most divergent in terms of size and chemical composition. Though there is considerable variability, all lipids are amphipathic in nature. That is, they contain both polar and nonpolar regions. In our figure, in the center of the slide, we have the structural formula for the fatty acid palmitate. You'll notice it contains a polar region 
on the far right composed of a carboxylate group and a nonpolar region outlined in red that is a long hydrocarbon chain. Though it has these two regions, both polar and nonpolar regions, according to surface area it is mostly nonpolar. For this reason it is very hydrophobic, that is, water insoluble, as we'll learn more particularly in Chapter 2. Other lipids can vary in terms of the dimensions of their polar and nonpolar regions. To find the polar component of a lipid molecule, just look for a net charge, such as in this case, or for an electron withdrawing element like oxygen. In our next video lesson, we'll learn how we can construct larger macromolecules from these basic units, and we'll see that one class of biological molecule is not able to form these larger polymeric structures.